So the PC was a big technological innovation because it could do many, many things in a single machine. You know, then came chat GPT, which can access all the internet to answer very complicated questions and even do programming. Right, so we can call these as forms of digital intelligence as API. They can manipulate digital data and do things that we want them to do. You know, but what about a machine which can do the kind of physical tasks we do in our daily life, whether it be in houses or whether it be it in industries? Right, so what about a robotic system doing these things? And this is what I'm going to refer to as a physical intelligence as API, where I can show a task I want my robot to do, and it can do it. So if we were to look at science fiction, you know, these robots have existed, and this has been a reality. But let's do a reality check on where are we today in, in towards this dream. So what we have become really, really good is that building systems which are very, very good at one particular task as evidenced by this video. Right? But once we take these systems not in that one specific environment or that one specific task, but we want them to do something as simple as walking on diverse terrains, you know, this is what we end up getting. And <laughs> this is a video from the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2015. And these are not the worst teams, but actually the best teams competing in this challenge. Right? It's not just about you know, walking, but also doing things which are very easy for us. For example, <laughs> opening doorknobs, so on and so forth. So why is this the case? Right? So you know, to make the point, let me ask you a question. You know, which one of these do you think is harder? You know, a robot doing a backflip or a robot walking? How many of you think it's a backflip? Maybe some of you, right? So, you know, both of these tasks are actually hard, but in a very different way. But in the backflip, you have to reason about your body, but you don't need to generalize. It's a very specialized task. Whereas when you're walking, you really need to go on different terrains. You know, if you're on ice, it's more slippery. If you are on you know, mud, you know, it can go in, you know, you can press it, right? So there are challenges associated with generalization which one needs to encounter. And this is really a big challenge in making these systems work in the real world. So the approach that we have been taking is deviating from how people have been building these controllers is to use some task-specific knowledge which allows them to work in a particular environment. But then we cannot potentially enumerate all the different environments a robot might encounter. Right? So an idea which you know, my lab and many other labs have been leveraging is can we use large amounts of data to learn robust skills? Right? So the idea being, you know, for example, we can go in simulation where we can present the robot with many, many different environments, and it's possible to collect large amounts of data in simulation. You know, for example, in three hours, we can collect 100 days worth of data. Right? And then you know, these systems can learn you know, say how to walk in simulation, and then we can test them in the real world. Right? So I'm going to show some results. You know, for example, we were able to achieve the fastest speed you know, on this particular robot you know, at the time the paper was published. But now the cool thing is we can take this robot outside on more challenging terrains, you know, such as, you know, slipping on ice, so it's able to rotate while maintaining its balance. Or we could take it, you know, or ask it to climb on this gravelly hill. So what you notice is that the robot is you know, doing the task, but maybe not in the most elegant way, but it, you know, gets the job done. You know, here's another example where we were testing the robot just outside the building. And what you will notice it, at some point, one of the screws in the motor comes out. So this robot starts limping, but it continues to walk, right? And that's the kind of robustness that we want to see in, you know, our robotic systems. 
So now once this robot was able to walk and run, you know, we can start doing more fun things, you know, for example, you know, having this robot play with a soccer ball, but really as a test to see if the robot can do some manipulation while still maintaining its balance, right? Because you need to balance yourself on some legs and then use the other leg to kick the ball. And if the robot were to fall down, you know, it recovers and continues, you know, doing the task it was trained to. And, you know, then you can really put it on something more challenging, like trying to dribble on ice. So, you know, I mean, the robot is struggling because the ice is slippery, but still it can recover, maintain its balance, and still go and, you know, kick the ball. So let's shift gears and, you know, talk about, you know, using tools, right? What about manipulation? Right. So before even we can go to tool use, you know, the question we posed is, you know, could we get the kind of dexterity that human's hand have, right? I mean, sometimes we're doing things for fun, you know, but many times, you know, this dexterity is very important, you know, for example, over here, a man, you know, eating food, right? So what we did was, you know, we again were training in simulation, you know, collecting large amounts of data of this, this robot reorienting objects. Then we can deploy these systems in the real world. So just to familiarize you with the setup, you know, we have a camera which is observing what's happening. It goes to this controller which outputs, you know, what actions to take. This is just a side view of a setup, and we're going to test it on new objects that the system had never seen before. So here is one example where on the top right, you see the orientation in which we want the hand to configure the object. And let's see what the system does. So it's trying to you know, orient the object in the target orientation. Here's another example where now we hand off you know, this mug to the robot. It will try to orient it to its goal. And then it will stop when it reaches the correct orientation. And then again, go to the next goal. Right, so these systems are trying to demonstrate you know, that we can, you know, make progress on dexterity. The systems by no means are perfect, but certainly a step in a promising direction. So until now, what I talked about was collecting data from simulators, but there are other ways of also collecting data. You know, for example, a human might demonstrate how to perform the task, which might be easier than, you know, a robot collecting data sometimes, right? So for example, over here, you know, Anthony, one of my students, you know, he gives these demonstrations of trying to hang this mug on a rack, but notice that he is only giving demonstrations when the mug is upright, right? And to be data efficient, what you would want is a robot should be able to learn from this and be able to manipulate the mug no matter what orientation it appears on, right? So for example, over here, you see a side, uh, a mug, you know, which is on the side and still it's able to, you know, complete the task. Now, sometimes, you know, giving these demonstrations are tedious, so you might want the robot to learn by just looking at videos. Because if you can do it, you know, then, you know, we could watch YouTube and collect, you know, even more data, right? And, you know, this is, again, you know, an exciting research direction where, for example, Diane demonstrates this, you know, uh, tying task, and the robot, you know, tries to repeat what it saw. So in summary, you know, we are looking at how we can make our robots more capable by collecting large amounts of data through different means as a way to attempt and reach physical intelligence as API. Thank you.